powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It drops tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. and it is brought to you this hour by PropSwap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bet and take your profit. Find out how at PropSwap.com or download the PropSwap app today. I'm Mike Hill. Jeff Bosher from the Inside the Birds podcast is here for another edition of Football at Four. We got uh, some stuff to dive into today. And uh, what's going on, Mosh? How you doing, man? What's going on? I'm doing all right, man. Two weeks to go until training camp. I feel like we can almost taste it now. It's like right there. I feel like there's stuff happening. It's right there. It's kind of brewing, and I'm ready for this to go. Like you got the home run derby Monday, the all-star game. So you're really going to have that bleak period, and then boom, football is going to be here. Hey, it says a lot about the Phillies when you're two weeks away from training camp and uh, coming a, a team with for a team coming off four wins that you're raring to go. Uh, yes. Well, Phillies, you know, <laughs> they get the four game sweep against the Cubs here. That maybe turns some things around. I'm not anticipating uh, that, but uh, that, let's get into a couple interesting things that have happened over the last 48 hours. I thought uh, last night, you know, everybody's going to be talking, Mosh. You're starting to see a little bit. Hey, Darius Slay sending out the feelers there for Steven Nelson. And Nelson seems like he's uh, he wants to play along. He seems like he's interested. So is there some sort of. Uh, you know, uh, inside understanding or agreement that we should be aware of here? I wouldn't say so. I'm sure that the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and Darius Slay of all people has to be looking at the roster thinking, oh, my Lord, you know, at at cornerback, like, man, are are we going to be in trouble? Although I would say Darius Slay's job is going to be a lot easier this year if if the other corners stay as currently constituted because they'll just be throwing at those guys all the time and you won't even have to throw – at Darius Slay, it might make him look better. But if they want to win anything and really stop any anybody on defense, they they clearly need a better option at corner or one of these guys that we talk about all the time really needs to step up in a way that, that would be hard to see right now. I don't think anything's going to change from Howie Roseman's standpoint as far as what your valuation, not evaluation, but what your valuation of Steven Nelson is. If you see him as a two to four million dollar a year corner you're not at this point getting desperate and trying to pay him five to six million you're paying him what you think he's worth and if he takes it okay if he gets a better deal or less money to play for a more competitive team okay you have to live with those results um let's right now signing a free agent of that magnitude i mean it's not huge money but they probably can't even fit him under the cap correct well, I mean, they can fit anyone under the cap if they defer the money like they've done with everybody they've signed this year. You give a guy, uh, you know, a million, million and a half, and then you, you know, of, of whatever the agreement is, you build some incentives in. A guy like that, I think you would probably have more incentives to, to make sure that if he's going to be around or if he's going to make his, his money, um, you want him motivated and playing well. It's a one-year deal anyway, so you would probably build some in. But you can, you know, you can obviously, you know, the dummy years. They've been doing that for mm-hmm. for in-house restructures and for for free agents that they've signed. Um, obviously, yeah. Darius Slay says to Stephen Nelson, "Hey, you would look green, good in green. Like green would look good on you, man." And Nelson, you know, responds like, "Hey, if it were only uh, what is it? if it, it could all be that simple, my man." So in other words, like just tell your guy to make the call, and uh, we can get this thing done. Uh, obviously, Slay, obviously Slay, as you mentioned, is looking across from him and saying, we need somebody over there. So he throws out the bait. Um, the question that I have for you, Mosh, is I know that it's been looked at at what they have currently not good enough, but is bringing Steven Nelson in here, does that make this defense more competitive in terms of it changes the level of who they are now? You bring him in here, whoa, all of a sudden you're here. Yeah, it makes them more competitive, certainly. Does it fix them and turn them into a top-10 defense? Probably not. But if you look at certain matchups, and Quentin Michael and Jason Avant talked about this on the Q&A show that dropped this morning. Say the Giants. You, you play a team like the Giants that brought in Kenny Galladay this offseason. Kenny Galladay, when healthy, is a, is a good wide receiver. Not a great one, but a good one who's been a good touchdown target, right? He's a guy that is not exceptionally fluid. I mean, he, he's a kind of a deep-threat guy contested catch kind of guy 
that's the type of guy that I think Darius Slay can be all right with. He can, he can hold down uh, Kenny Galladay. He's supposed to. That's supposed to be a guy that Darius Slay should be able to hold down, former teammate, right? However, if that's the case, if you're locking Darius Slay up on Kenny Galladay, then who's covering Darius Slayton? Darius Slayton is now the kind of number two wide receiver. He's already given the Eagles fits as a number one Giants wide receiver. Now you're looking at a guy like Darius Slay matched up against Zach McPherson or Craig James or Michael Jaquette, right? And that's a game changer for the opponent right there. That's that's at least 10 to 12 targets to Darius Slayton and against whoever's lining up that you like the offensive advantage there. You put Steven Nelson there, a little bit more experienced, a little more savvy, has played the position um, well, didn't have a great year last year, but still better than what you are getting from the other options there. Then you feel a little bit better about matching up with Darius Slayton in that regard. Now, I just brought up the Giants. How about the Cowboys who have Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb and Michael Gallup? And you're going to face a lot of teams this year when it's Kansas City, when it's Tampa Bay, who have really good number two receivers and number three guys who can move to the outside if need be. And that's where that's that's going to be a spot. You talk about the game within the game, right, Mike, and all the good quarterbacks who prior to the snap know where the openings are going to be. Well, that's an area that you know no matter what, how good the pass rush is, the quarterback's going to know he's going there and have an opportunity to make make a play. Yeah, you now it's funny because I have seen, you know, look at the pro football focus rankings or uh, this executive's rankings or yada, yada, yada. Nelson ranked higher than Slay. We're just assuming that Slay's the better player. Is that the case? I mean, I'm, I respect PFF. I do question some of their how they come up with some of their rankings. I can only tell you that, you know, I have some pretty good sources in Kansas City and in Pittsburgh with two teams that he's played for. And the message I have is that he's a good player who tends to think he's a little bit better than he is, um, has been the beneficiary of playing uh, with good fronts. Obviously, the Steelers get a lot of pressure with the way they run their defense, Kansas City as well. He would theoretically Um, have a good front here. Yeah, he would theoretically have a good front, right? I mean, good front four, um, you know, not necessarily as good of a front seven as maybe those uh, those other teams. But, yeah, and we have to see whether Jonathan Gannon's pass rush schemes are, are going to work or not. But, yeah, the, but the bottom line is the message is he's a, he's a two-corner, maybe a three, number three corner who can be a number two corner, but nothing more than that. Um, obviously, either way, better than what they have currently. Of course. <laughs> currently <laughs> better. Um Let me get your take then um, where we are with Zach Ertz because there's now starting to feel like he's going to show up to camp. Yeah, I think we talked about it last week where there was that report where the the, the bills were close and uh, that that was not what I was hearing. And so obviously he's still here. Well, actually, it's funny because um, Merle basically had to go out and walk that back because I guess apparently he had recorded the interview a couple of weeks ago. The interview oh. aired at a you know later date, and he said, "Look, that was recorded when I was here." With you know, so he did kind of come out and defend himself on that. Okay, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, Zach Ertz faces that that situation where if you don't report to camp. You get fined pretty heavily now. It used to be you could hold out all you want, you know, and and now you get pretty steep, pretty heavy fines for not showing up. Now, the question is, if he shows up, what do the Eagles do with him? Does he practice first team? Are they 12 personnel from the start? Do they act like he's just a a player on the team and they're going to proceed forward like they did with Alshon Jeffrey last year? Um, Or are they going to basically say, all right, you're here. We'll we'll kind of treat you like the the over 30 veterans and – we won't, you know, you won't do too much. It'll be interesting to see exactly because because the last thing they they can afford is for him to get hurt, right, in training camp. Because the whole purpose of holding on to him at this point, I would think, is to try to trade him to a team that is now desperate because they suffered an injury at tight end. So what happens if you you're running Ertz out there with the first team and he breaks his leg? Then then you literally have the Alshon Jeffrey thing all over again, where you can't get rid of that that guy nor that salary. Yeah. So. It'll be interesting to see what happens when he shows up. Yeah, well, it, I guess it's one of those things um, where, you know, and you take, like, stuff that Spadaro says, I guess, with a grain of salt, but um, he said that my sense is Zach Ertz will be one of those players reporting after that. We'll see how it plays out. So, in other words, hey, if uh, he's still on the roster, when training camp comes, 
he will be here. If it gets to that point and he's at camp, that will be interesting to see if the Eagles then feel compelled to move him once he already shows up. That will be the yeah. next. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think training camp eve, which is going to be what, July 27th, is it, or 26th? 26th. He says, my, 26. he's, this is what Spadaro said. I think he was on Sirius, uh, I guess, this morning or maybe yesterday. He said, when players report to training camp on July 27th, my sense is Zach Ertz will be one of those players reporting. After that, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, training camp eve, July 26th, will be an interesting day. I, I mean, I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying, like, obviously that then – if you want to, if you do not want Zach Ertz even on the roster, potential of getting hurt, you're gonna. That's your deadline day, you know, to to make something happen. Yeah, because you, so you're you're suggesting, you know, not reporting, suggesting if he gets to camp, if he and he shows up, then the the Eagles feel like okay, he's here. Let's just roll with him. Well, I, I'm saying that if he shows up and he's there, then they have a difficult decision to make of how much they want to get him on the field and risk an injury. Well, that's another point, I guess, right? You know, because then he's on a one-year deal. You can't trade him if he's hurt. Yeah, that I mean, it defeats the, the whole purpose if your point is to still get rid of him. So, so you I think mean, I, you think if he shows up to camp, uh, then you got to play him with kid gloves? I, I, this is why I, I if if I were running the show, which I'm not, nor am I qualified <laughs> to, but I mean, I, I probably would have done something differently by now. Right. Uh, yeah. Well. There's so much. There's so many layers there. Something differently by now. All right. Well, they're not getting uh, what they want, right? That's obvious. Correct. Um, the whole it ties back to the Stephen Nelson thing. Hey, you would look good in green. Well, if it was only that easy. Well, let us just move this guy. Then we can go <laughs> get you. You know what I mean? Like, don't sign with anybody else. There's a spot for you here. We just got to figure out how to open that spot. Yeah. Yeah, Howie Roseman, he, he makes mistakes, but he's also smarter than me, and I have a feeling he's got a plan in his head, and we'll see if it works out. And if not, which we've questioned some of the moves before and saying, did you actually have a plan what's, with this? What's then more, we'll criticize it then. What's more likely, Mosh, Ertz is here week one or Steven Nelson? Week one of the regular season? Yeah. Steven Nelson. Not saying that that's very likely. I'm just saying I think that that's more likely than Zach Ertz. That's that's a pretty bold statement. I don't think it is really. <laughs> I'm just saying, like Stephen Nelson. Now, if you had thrown in, so you put me in a spot. If you had thrown in, neither are here. I probably would have picked that one over. <laughs> but you know, that's not fair. Well, I don't want to play that game. That's no fun. Jeff Bosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. Um, Doug Peterson uh, was on Sirius XM NFL Radio today, and this was interesting because he mentioned like the whole uh, Jalen Hurts thing about why they drafted him. Now, he's not here anymore. Are you buying what he's selling? That, hey, this is what we do. And he mentioned, like, this is what we do. And they're always, we're always, he said, we're always going to do that. In other words, we value the backup quarterback. So, that it was the first part. Of, who, who said this? Doug Peterson today. He, mm-hmm. You know, he basically was saying that, look, we did not draft Jalen Hurts to undermine um, Carson, Carson Wentz. Wentz. We drafted him because... We value the backup quarterback. We won a Super Bowl with the backup quarterback, and we will continue to look for quarterbacks. Is he still speaking on behalf of the Eagles? I'm shocked by that. What does he mean by we? Right, he says, (laughs) and we continue to look for quarterbacks, and that's always something that will never change. We won a Super Bowl with our backup quarterback, and we've had to play with our backups a couple times in Philadelphia. So we did that a year ago and brought in Jalen Hurts, not to undermine Mm -hmm. Carson Wentz, not to do anything to take his job or anything because Carson was our starter. He was the franchise. But we wanted someone that could come in and could be the backup and learn how to play the NFL game. Well, I can only speak to the the first part. Well, I can speak to both. But from a reporting standpoint, the first part of that is true. I mean, that's something that Adam and I have consistently said. There has been there have been multiple conspiracy theories. There have been things that people have said just to pump up Jalen Hurts a little extra more about how this was all the plan from the start that are just not true. They drafted him to be a backup quarterback at a at a at a cheaper rate than the going rate they were paying for backup quarterbacks, which had become 20 million, I think, or whatever, yeah. 12 million, I forget, to whatever Nick Foles made there in that uh, last year. But it had gotten to an absurd amount. Now, when Doug says we will continue, 
I believe that because wherever he is, and he's part of that Andy Reid chain, who's part of that Mike um, Holmgren chain, part of the Ron Wolf chain, which is we draft quarterbacks pretty frequently in the later, you know, in the in the later stages of the draft to try to get our future backups so that we don't have to pay for them. But I will continue to maintain that doing that in the second round is not good business. And none of those pass Packers guys ever did that. And I don't know why the Eagles thought that this was like, uh, you know, that they were reinventing the wheel here. I, Cause as you saw the result, it did not work out well for them. Right. Well, so, in hindsight, 2020, mm-hmm. if they don't draft Hertz in the second round is Wentz still the guy here. It's a great question. I think there's a better chance that he is than he isn't. I mean, obviously the offensive line injuries still have to be accounted for and the pounding that he took and and other things. But, you know, obviously Carson was not happy about being benched for Jalen Hurts. And would they have benched him for, say, Clayton Thorson if Thorson had made the team and was in his second year at the time or Nate Sudfeld? I don't know about that. Right. Now, so it, in, caused, it, it caused an issue. And again, in hindsight, are you better off with the value and return you got for Wentz, because you took Hurts, you were able to do that, or just keeping Wentz? <laughs> Great question. I don't know. Uh, that's like you're asking me, would it have been better? Would the Eagles have been better if they had Jeremy Chin at safety last year instead of Jalen Hurts? Would that have helped save the defense? Maybe. <laughs> well, that's what, and that's funny you say that because I said, look, were they a safety away from not being a four-win team? But now they at least – they took a quarterback that allowed them to make a decision on the other quarterback. Yeah, but then they went and had to make moves to get three first-round picks in case that guy is not their quarterback. So right. for every action, there's a reaction, which just basically goes to show you that the Eagles aren't sure. They don't know. I mean, I'm not saying that as a, they're absent-minded. I mean, they just, just they're just like us. They have a lot of uh, – they didn't expect this happening. That I can very much tell you. No conspiracies here when they drafted Jalen Hurts. They did not look a year ahead and say – Carson Wentz is going to hate us, want to leave. We're going to have to trade him. We're going to have to maneuver. Yada, yada. They did not see that coming. Right. And so they're – Totally they're, agree with that. Right. They're trying to fly by the seat of their pants a little bit but still be a good team and still try to do what they can. And, and for that, they've done a decent job of at least collecting a lot of draft capital to help themselves. But they're entering kind of an uncharted, unknown territory. Right, because that's what I'm saying. Like, they draft this guy in the second round. They are able to now find out that the guy they – wasn't the guy they thought he was. So you got all this draft capital, which is probably better in the end hindsight than having Jeremy Chin. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Chin had a pretty good year now last year. So we'll have he, to see. He did. He did. Absolutely. You're right. And, and I, I mean, this is funny. almost like getting into, all right, well, if we didn't miss on JJ Ortega Whiteside, we wouldn't have discovered Travis Fulgham has some really good ability. And right. if Travis Fulgham becomes really good, we could say that yeah, it's good. We missed on JJ Ortega <laughs> Whiteside because now, I mean, you get into a point where it gets a little silly here. You just want your team oh, to be, I agree. make good decisions. But you the know? funny part is when, when, before you came on, when I was talking about this, you know, scenario i mentioned you could have had jeremy chin does he make you like are you feeling so much more confident now if jeremy chin's playing safety instead of anthony harris i don't know probably <laughs> i mean he, he had a good year i mean he may, maybe he'll stink this year maybe he'll become a, a pro bowler this or if year. you get know. the anthony harris that you got in minnesota two years ago perhaps uh real maybe. quick i do want to get your opinion on this uh they're doing the series over at espn where they're asking the executives uh about to rank their players Fletcher Cox ranked number five as an interior lineman. And basically, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if the team still looks at him like it was like, hey, do we have to game plan? Like the, when we play the Eagles, executives are still saying, hey, we need to know where Fletcher Cox. Did you see that from him last year? Well, I mean, I thought you saw an inconsistent player last year for what he has been. I mean, I do still think he is one of the better defensive tackles in the league. And I do believe that when you see how offenses um, align to stop him, you do see double teams on Fletcher Cox. So he's still the, the, the guy that you draw the circle around when you're game planning for the Eagles until he just doesn't become a good player. But he's still a good player. He's still a guy who can displace uh, offensive linemen you know, from right to left or left to right in a way that not a lot of guys can. He can drive guys back. He can rush the passer. Is he as explosive as he has? sideline to sideline as he was three, four, five years ago? Maybe not. Probably not. He's played a lot of snaps the last few years. But, you know, we, we th- that's not uncommon at the position that he plays. And I still think he's one of the better defensive tackles in the league. And if he if he's healthy and fresh and the D-line around him is playing well, then you got a chance to get yourself still a yeah. pretty good player out there. 
yeah, I'm interested. Like, at what point, like, can you no longer count on Fletcher Cox being Fletcher Cox? And, uh, you know, does that decline your defense? Same thing with Brandon Graham. I was admittedly not a fan of the contract they gave him. He has outperformed um, what I thought he would do. But mm-hmm. you're wondering, at what point does Brandon Graham just turn into just an average guy? And Fletcher Cox, same thing, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very fair question. You know, I, I have no idea if, if Fletcher Cox is about to become Derek Landry overnight. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I feel like he's always been kind of um, a different kind of cat. Like, he's not the most – he's like a – you know, when you talk about a physical specimen, usually you're talking about a guy built like an Adonis. He's not built like an Adonis, but he has some – freakish strength like um that that you know like i said the ability to kind of pick up a a guard and move him left or right with his two hands he's always had that um whether he's playing really well or not so some of that stuff just doesn't doesn't go that's what your whole hallmark is when it goes you might really become just an average player i don't know that i see that happening but you know there's a lot of things that i don't see happening that wind up happening in the nfl man this is a good one Uh, good football (laughs) at four today we got it two weeks from now uh, July 27th, that will be uh, two Tuesdays from now, actually. Uh, actually, three Tuesdays from now is when mm-hmm. they will open up. So uh, just under three weeks to go until Eagles training camp opens and all the storylines will start. The guys over at the Inside the Birds podcast, it drops tomorrow morning. Uh, the Giants pod is the most recent one that is up now with Greg Cosell, so you can check that out. Tomorrow, Adam Kaplan is here Andrew will continue our uh, divisional looks on Friday, and uh, we're looking forward to that. All right, man. We will catch up with you uh, on Monday. All right. Have a great weekend, Mike. Uh, Check out the Inside the Birds podcast, Jeff Bosher and Adam Kaplan.